Hello everyone and welcome to our latest webinar. My name is Rob Newton and I'm the marketing manager here at Visual Impact. Thanks for joining us. Um, today, Alistair Chapman, renowned experienced DOP and certified trainer for Sony, uh -huh. will be explaining some practical shooting tips for the Sony FS5 and FS7. So um, welcome Alistair. Good morning everybody. Okay, for those of you who don't know, I'm sure you do, if you've been on one of our webinars before, uh, Alice has been working in the broadcast industry for over 25 years, it says here, so he must have started when he was 10, I guess. Um, <laughs> and he's been shooting commercials, documentaries, he runs workshops, vast experience, so it's good to have him here so he can share his vast knowledge and experience. I'm sure you'll get an awful lot out of today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, uh, just some housekeeping things. Um, on your screen there'll be a question box. Please, please use the question box. Um, ask plenty of questions, we'll be answering them as we go through. Yeah. And it's very important if you want to get as much out yes. of your webinar as you can. Yeah, the more questions the better. It makes it a much more interesting event for everybody with lots and lots of questions. So, you know, start thinking of those questions and uh, uh, comments and things like that and, and fire the matter straight away and we can then add them to our queue to be answered. Yeah. And of course, there's always a prize for the person who can stump Alistair, so that, that, that's up for grabs. And anything we can't answer now, obviously, we'll email you later on. And um, David can stop distracting us with silly comments like that, because I am <laughs> old enough to have been working in this industry for 20 years. Um, we are also recording it, so if anyone misses it, or wants to listen to it again, or share it with their family and friends, then um, we'll be sending a link probably either tomorrow or Monday, just to uh, of, of the recording so you can have a look at that so so that's available too um, you may not know this but as well as uh, webinars like this we also run um, events here in uh, Teddington so if you want to get your hands on the kit maybe see what Alistair looks like see what I look like uh, you should probably be well disappointed with me um, then have, have a look at our website um, visuals.co.uk slash events um, we've got an awful lot uh, coming up during August um, on, on a variety of topics. So it's well worth checking out. So yeah, well, we, I see we do have some questions coming in already. Just because we don't answer them immediately, it doesn't mean that we're ignoring you. We will answer as many questions as you can. So do keep them coming in, even though we won't actually perhaps answer them immediately. But, but no, it's nice to see some questions coming in already. Yeah. Um, and we have an audience poll. So this will just allow Alistair to modify his presentation to see what the audience are like. So what camera are you using at the moment? So are you using the FS5, FS7, a little bit of both, or something completely different? Because I believe there are other manufacturers other than Sony. So really? To, yeah, I can't believe There that. are other people that make cameras? Apparently so. Oh. Apparently so. Who so is? if you wouldn't mind just pressing... Who's that? I don't know. Some, oh, some okay. Right. Just the irrelevant little tiny company yes. that nobody cares about. Exactly, yeah. Until our next seminar. Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, so there we go. If everyone can press the button. Um, interestingly, wow. so far, a lot of people. Lot of something else is. <laughs> yes, which um, is very interesting. Very mm -hmm. interesting indeed. So. Um, okay. Interesting. Yeah, a lot of people have voted now. Yeah, we're looking at quite a few on the FS5, not so many on the FS7, um, but a lot on the something else. So. Um, Hopefully okay. you'll still get some value out of today's so session. Mostly FS5 users, users though. It's a, of the people listening seems to be the largest percentage other yes. than something else. So at the moment we've got 26% FS5, 10% FS7, 15% both, and 46 something else. Okay. So shall we um Yes, on? yeah, we'll start. And I'm sure Alistair will go through it, but a lot of these hints and tips I'm sure you'll be able to transfer to other cameras as well. So um, hope you'll enjoy it, Alistair. Okay, so yeah, don't forget, keep those questions coming in and we will answer as many of them as we can. We've already got a few, so uh, but, but do keep them coming in. Um, as, as we've already said, 20 years or so working in television, all types of things. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a Sony employee, so I'm not paid a salary or anything like that by Sony, but I am paid to do events and things like that, uh, such as this, um, you know, quite quite happy to admit that. Um, so I do get paid to do some stuff for Sony, but I have a really good working relationship with Sony that goes back many, many years, because I used to actually shoot corporate videos for Sony, and that's how I sort of really got it introduced to a lot of people at Sony. But I am uh, first and foremost most a freelance cameraman, cinematographer, whatever you want to call it. Actually, quite interestingly, 
um, I attended some seminars uh, with Vittorio Storaro, who did Apocalypse Now, has just done the new Woody Allen film, the Cafe Royale. Okay. And um, he was really, really, really hates the term director of photography. And it was, he, he, had, he had a point, actually, because um, he said, on a film, there can only be one director. You can't have multiple directors because that leads to debate and discussion that's, that's not helpful. You need to have somebody that's in charge, the director. And you're a cinematographer, you're a filmmaker, you're a cameraman at the end of the day. Yeah, you might be the best cameraman and cinematographer in the world, but you're still a film shooter. You are still the cameraman, camera operator. You are the cinema, as in film, and photographer, as in photographer, so the film capturer. And so he said, you know, even though he's you know, really at the top of his game, he's a cinematographer. He's not a director of photography. The director is Woody Allen. Sure. It was quite an interesting thing, just as an aside. Anyway, nothing to do with the cameras, really, so I'm just waffling. Um, so let's move on. So practical shooting tips for the FS5 and FS7. And... Um, Based on the poll, we're going to obviously try and bias this a little bit towards FS5. But um, a lot of these are relevant to both cameras, so they're actually a lot of it sort of practical stuff that I've picked up over the years shooting with large sensor cameras. Now, the first thing, and this is important, is to ensure your firmware is up to date. So if you have an FS5, you should be on firmware version 2.0 currently. And if you're on an FS7, you should be on version 4. And there is a nice link here, one single link, sony.co.uk forward slash pro forward slash article forward slash broadcast dash products dash firmware dash equipment. And I'm sure you can all remember that really easily. <laughs> yes. But that one page has the vast majority of the current firmware updates for the vast majority of Sony cameras. So you don't have to have lots of different links for different cameras. That one page will, will get you all there. Um, and that's where you'll find them. It's the same firmware wherever in the world you are. So it doesn't matter if you're in Hong Kong or whether you're here in the UK, that one page, the firmware will work for your camera and is going to be the correct camera, firmware for your, for your camera. If you have an FS5 and you have the 18 to 105 millimeter kit lens, then there is also a firmware update for that. That was released um, April, May time. And the link is there for you if you want to get that firmware. So that comes from Sony consumer side as opposed to the broadcast side. Um, so make sure your firmware is up to date. Now, the next thing to consider is you really do need to start thinking about UHD, 4K and HDR. Now, this isn't going to be a seminar on these things, but it's really something you do need to consider because things you shoot today now you know, may have some value in the future. And we use this term a lot, future proofing, but it really is something to consider. Sky TV starts their UHD broadcast service in two weeks time. I think it's the 20th of August it starts in the UK. And if you have Sky Q and a 4K TV, you'll be able to watch 4K from Sky. Um, and you obviously Netflix and all of those people, Amazon, they're streaming in 4K already. So 4K is not something that's going to happen three, four years time. It's happening now. It really is. Um, so 4K in the home is set to become common in the next, really, next couple of years because there's very little price increase of a decent TV. If you're going to buy a, a mid-range or decent TV, you don't have to pay any extra for 4K now. You go into Curry's or Dixon's or uh, Dixon's, they've let it on go on. <laughs> Curry's, um, and you'll find lots and lots of 4K TVs there. And the other thing now is that actually there's virtually no premium for HDR. If you... Do your homework. Um, I noticed that Samsung are now selling some, um, uh, I think they're 49 inch 4K HDR TVs for around about 400 pounds. Cool. You know, it, it's just not expensive now. I mean, if we go back three or four years, a 4K TV was 20,000 pounds. Yeah. Now they're no more expensive than any other decent TV. And HDR does look stunning. So very, very quickly, what is HDR in case you haven't seen it? So imagine this is a, one of my shots, shots of a bolt of lightning in standard dynamic range. Looks like that on your TV. And the important thing to note is that with HDR, white is still white. White doesn't get any brighter. If you think about it, you know, in, in your, the room that you're in, you turn the lights up and down, room gets brighter and duller. But relative to the room, white is still white relative yeah. to everything else. It doesn't really change. And with HDR, white doesn't become brighter. White is always the same brightness. Now, in this shot here, you've got that bolt of lightning coming out of the cloud. 
because this is standard dynamic range, of course, the lightning is barely any brighter than a white piece of paper would be in this shot. It's a little bit brighter, but only a tiny bit. Because in the real world, we know that lightning is much, much brighter. Um, so in HDR world, if you had an HDR TV, ta-da, the lightning would look like that. It would be brilliantly bright and much brighter than the white. Now, obviously, unless you have an HDR monitor, which I very much doubt, yeah, you're not going to see this. But HDR is important and it is significant. So before we do continue, one quick survey. Are you shooting UHD and 4K? Because um, I'd really like to know about this because I think it's really important that everybody starts thinking about it and starts taking this seriously. Yeah, um, it, it's not anymore. It's not just something you think, oh, I'll get around to it in a few years. I think you really start needing to think about it quite seriously. So we little poll uh, open right now. No, I'm not shooting UHD 4K. No, but thinking about it. Yes, a little bit. And yes, lots. And so straight away, just looking at it, uh, the majority is yes, a little bit. And that's changed Excellent. in the last six months. That's changed because mm. we did a, a similar poll we did. about six months ago. And it was much a predominantly um, no, but yes. thinking about it. But yes. now we're predominantly yes and a little bit with the next one being no, but thinking about it. And we have 4% yes lots, 46 yes, a little bit, 37 no, but thinking about it. And only 30, only 12, 13% no. So yeah, it's mm. gaining traction it and changed it's, a lot. it's changed a lot yeah. since the last one we did. Okay, so we'll close that poll and move on. I think a few people as to were thinking, you know, we had the 3D sort of, uh, yes. you know, uh, uh, and that was, uh, everyone was looking at that and is that going to be the next thing? And a lot of manufacturers, of course, quite like new formats to come out because they oh, yeah. sell more kit. Yes. Uh, and possibly initially, maybe say, yeah, I would want in 4K was one of these things that people, oh, it's the same as 3D, it'll disappear in a few weeks or a few months yeah, so the problem uh, and with, the next flavour of the month. But I don't think this has. No, the problem with 3D was you had to put glasses on and that was the biggest problem. You had to do something different to watch TV. Sure. Whereas with 4K, other than buying the TV, you don't have to do anything different. And when you combine HDR and 4K, those two things together, the viewing experience is radically different to what we've had before. It's way better than normal TV. It really is. You know, it's not, not a small difference now. It is a big, big difference. Sure. 2020, bigger color, amazing color. You know, vivid, vivid vibrant colors, um, high contrast, so really bright highlights, really great reflections and tints and things like that. So the whole picture just looks so much better. And I think this is actually going to be, and we will get onto the camera stuff in a minute, I promise. Um, it's going to be a bit of a shake-up, actually, I think, for the movie business because the movie business is stuck in this rut of this skin tone and teal film look. Yeah. And, but now, and if you do watch Cafe Society, you'll appreciate what, what we're talking about to a degree, is the use of color and everything else can be so, so much greater and bigger and better that the, if the movies stay like that, they're going to get left behind by TV. Um, so it's interesting where we're going. Yeah, so let's move on, so. because otherwise we'll get stuck in this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> some tips. So consider using DB gain rather than ISO with your cameras. Um, and I think this is a, just an important concept. ISO is certainly very fashionable, because ISO makes you sound like a film cameraman. I'm a cinematographer. Cinematographers use ISO. Um, but you have to face the fact that you're using an electronic camera. It is not a film camera. Film cameras obviously change the ISO, you physically change the film stock. A video camera, well, you can't change the sensor, you're just changing the sensor. You're, well, you're not changing the sensitivity, you're changing the gain of the camera. You're turning the volume up and down, basically. So really, in a video camera, the sensitivity is actually fixed, more or less. Some cameras can do some clever trickery in the sensor that has some variation, but basically it's, it's pretty much fixed. And then you're using gain to amplify that signal and make it brighter in low light. But you're not actually making the camera more sensitive. So really, you're not actually changing the ISO of the camera. You're just changing the gain. And one of the big things is we'll, we always talk about, you know, best picture is at the native ISO. And this, this term now, native ISO, you see it thrown around all over the place, place and used everywhere. Well, native ISO is zero gain, zero dB. But the problem with ISO is the native ISO number changes depending on the gamma curve that you're using because different gamma curves record at different levels. So if you were using an external light meter, you'd have to offset that light meter with these different ISOs to get the correct exposure. 
So really, ISO only changes so that if you're using an external light meter, you'd get the right exposure. The reality is the gain is still 0 dB at the native ISO. And what's important as a camera operator, because most of us are not using external light meters, let's face it, is how much gain have I got? Because the gain affects the noise. And I hear other people say, well, no, no, I need to know the ISO because I need to know how sensitive the camera is. Well, actually, no, you don't. You need to know how much noise there is because it's the noise that's going to screw you up. Um, and we all know anybody that's shot with a traditional ENG camera, you know, you used to think about it, zero dB, nice clean picture, plus six dB, a little bit of noise, be all right, plus 12 dB, mm, borderline, plus 18 dB, no go. Well, it's the same with any camera. You know, they're all the same, plus six, plus 12. We, you, and you can picture that in your head, how much noise that means and everything else. It's much easier, much simpler. And you know that if you're at zero dB, native ISO so is going to be the best. Uh, ISO, though, there's so many different ISOs to remember. I mean, FS5 is terrible. So even with standard gammas, there are four different native ISOs. I can't even remember which ones are which for which curves. You know, and I've used yeah. these cameras day in, day out. If you use dB, it's easy, it's zero dB. So I'd really encourage people, where possible, to use dB. You can't always, sometimes the camera won't let you, but, but with an electronic camera, which is what these are, even if they are, if you want to call it a digital cinema camera or a digital filmmaking camera, it's still an electronic camera, dB is the correct measurement. Yes, I, th I think in the past there's been some sort of, um, you know, you, you, you want you aspire to a film camera, don't you? And, and indeed, yes. And you're only using a digital one because you know there wasn't the budget, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, rather than doing it on, mm. um, you know, the things that that can produce and the range of options you've got. So, but, but some of these terms they don't really transfer very well yeah. into electronic cameras. Our ISO doesn't really mean a great deal with an electronic camera. It's it's not the correct term to be using, but it, it, because it sounds film-like, it's very popular. And the other one, just moving on from that, that, that again, is shutter speed and shutter angle. Now, essentially in the camera, shutter angle, shutter speed, the way the camera functions from an electronic point of view is exactly the same with both of these. So there's no magic picture thing. You know, by using shutter angle, you don't get a better picture or a different picture. It's the same picture. Um, but again, because shutter angle is a film term, it sounds cool. You know, oh, it sounds so much cooler to be a filmmaker and you <laughs> shutter angle 180 degree shutter is so much better than 150th because 150th is old fashioned. 150th is what we used to use. But the reality is it's an electronic camera. Um, now, there is a difference because shutter angle is always going to be a fraction of the frame rate. So if you change frame rate, the shutter speed changes. And there, there are conceivably some benefits for that, although nobody's actually proven that to me personally, that, that somebody can tell the difference between shooting at one, six, one at 60 frames per second with a 30th, sorry, start again, shooting at 30 frames per second with a 160th shutter, or shooting at 25 with a 150th shutter. I can't see the difference, and I don't believe anybody can. Um, but the big thing to remember is, and this is the key one, if you use a fixed shutter speed, you'll be able to keep your shutter in sync with the lighting. And this is the important thing. You know, if you want to avoid flicker, you want to avoid rolling bands down your pictures and things like that, you need to have a shutter speed that is a fraction of the frame rate, a fraction of the mains frequency. So consider using shutter speed rather than angle. It's much simpler. It's easier. Yeah, it doesn't sound as cool, but it's much less likely to give you a problem. So in Europe, 150th, 1 100th, 1 200th, 1 1 1 500th, they're all good. Um, in the USA, 1 60th, uh, 1 1 20th, and so on. Um, shooting 24 frames per second with 180 degree shutter, which is very popular, very common, results in a 1 48th shutter, and that can lead to problems under artificial lighting. So just make sure you're at least aware of that. So the next thing that I think is important is to make shooting as easy as possible for yourself as you can. Um, and actually, just before I go on to that, I've got a question that's come in, actually, does ISO gain affect depth of field? So uh, an interesting question. Well, ISO and gain only affect depth of field in so much as if you use a higher gain or higher ISO for any given light situation, you might be able to close the aperture. And closing the aperture gives you a shallower depth of field. So generally, if you use the lowest possible ISO or gain, 
typically 0 dB, that magic 0 dB, that magic um, native ISO, you'll have the largest aperture, and the largest aperture will give you the shallowest depth of field, assuming okay. you want the filmic look. Perhaps you don't want the filmic look, though. If you're doing using an FS5, FS7 for news or run and gun, stuff like that, it's not always a good thing to have your aperture at f1.8 because your depth of field is so shallow, it's going to be really challenging to keep anything in focus. Perhaps then, you know, the FS5, FS7, they're pretty good. You can put in 6 dB of gain a lot of the time and get away with it. Um, you could put in 3, 6 dB of gain, or 6 dB is the same as doubling the ISO. So maybe if you're starting at 1,000, go to 2,000 ISO. And that's going to allow you to close the aperture only by a stop, but it, does going to give, it is going to give you a bit more freedom on focus. So a useful thing to know, 6 dB is the same as doubling or halving the ISO, which is the same as one f-stop. Just a useful number to know. Um, so next thing, set up your assignable buttons. Keep your life simple. So on the FS5, button number three, which is right next to the other ND filter controls on the side of the camera, if you want to use the auto ND function, you have to assign it to a button. So I normally assign auto ND to that button so I can turn it on and off very quickly, very easily. Um, the status button, I don't tend to use that often anyway. Then on the FS5, button number six, which is on the back of the hand grip, I will assign that for either peaking or center crop. Normally for peaking, because um, actually with center crop, I tend to use clear image zoom instead, but I'll come on to that in a little bit. If you have an FS7, button number two, the iris button, if you're using the Cine EI function on that camera, I tend to assign that to high and low key because when you're in Cine EI, the button doesn't actually do anything. So you may as well assign it to high and low key, which is a really useful function when you're shooting in Cine EI to check your full exposure. Um, also FS5, make use of the picture profiles. The camera comes with nine picture profiles built into the camera and they're there for you to use. It's not just a button on the side of the camera that looks nice, it's there to be pressed, they're there to be used. So I've got a little quick rundown of those picture profiles here just to, to give you an idea of, of what they are. Now I've got an example image here but there is a difference in each one but actually when I run through the slides it all tends to look the same. I'll try and point out some of the differences. So this is picture profile number one. This is the standard look of the camera. It's based on 709. It's not quite 709. And it has slightly limited dynamic range, but gives you a nice contrasty picture. And one thing to notice, I don't know, it depends on how good your monitor is, you should be able to see that the clouds in this picture have that typical video look where they're a little bit clipped, a little bit compressed and washed out. And that's very typical of shooting with 709 type profile. Profile number two, this is designed to mimic a DSLR, and it's much more contrasty. The blacks are pulled down, they're almost crushed. Um, so it, it does give you deeper black, slightly crushed. It's also more saturated. Reds are a bit richer, and it does give you that kind of DSLR look, but that comes at a penalty of a slightly reduced dynamic range. So again, we have these clouds that look a little cropped, a little sort of uh, funky where they're overexposed. Um, but very useful if you do if you're shooting alongside DSLRs and things like that. Then we have picture profile number three. So picture profile number three, this is Rec 709, but it's combined with Sony's Pro Color Matrix. It's very slightly flatter than the standard look, a little bit less contrasty. And the Pro Color Matrix is actually really good. I, I really do like this particular color setting. The colors are very gradable gives you a nice color range and they're quite neutral. It, it's a little bit less of the Sony look with, with the Pro Matrix perhaps erring towards Canon a little bit more. Yeah. Um, so it's quite a good one if you're shooting alongside Canon cameras and, and maybe even sort of, uh, Panasonic cameras, things like that. So it's quite good for grading and everything else. It's still 709, but 709 gives you nice contrast. If you have 709, you'll get good on-screen contrast. Um, not so good for grading perhaps. Then picture profile four is 709 plus 709. Now, because this is 709 color, it is more saturated than picture profile three. So the colors are richer and stronger. Again, we still have this slight highlight problem with the clouds because it's 709, which is a limited dynamic range. To be honest, this profile I don't use. Uh, it's hard to grade, hard to do anything with. But if you are looking for something for TV news straight out of the camera, 
that's going to look good going direct from the camera straight to air, it's not a bad one uh, to, to choose. This is the one I tend to use the most, picture profile number five, if I want a direct from the camera look. And that's Cine Gamma 1 with Cinema Color. Now, Cine Gamma 1 has much better dynamic range. And if you look at the clouds in the shot, they're, they're still a little bit overexposed, but they, they, the camera is rolling off into those clouds a little bit better. It does handle overexposure much better. The picture does look a little bit flatter, though. And this is the trade-off when you've got a bigger capture dynamic range. The picture looks a little bit flatter. But because of that highlight roll-off and the way it works, it grades quite well. So if you want to do a little bit, not necessarily full, full on hardcore grade, but a little bit of adjustment and tweaking in post-production looks really good. It's also very forgiving if you are overexposed. It's not going to look bad. So generally very forgiving to shoot with. Highlights look nicer, tends to look a little bit more film-like. So this is my sort of go-to picture profile setting on this camera. Just dial it up, just choose picture profile number five, and you can shoot with it. Don't need to do anything with it. Very simple, easy to work with. Do you find that um, all of the cameras will have a similar look? So if you had two FS5s ah, and you put in profile number five, will well, yes, look if it's very two very FS5s, similar? they should look almost exact. They should be pretty much yeah, ident identical. I, I do actually have a slide on this in a minute because okay. matching cameras is something that is often asked. How do I make an FS5 match an FS7, etc.? So I'll come on to that in a minute. Okay. But, um, but yes, uh, the FS5s all set the same, should look the same. Um, so next slide, picture, uh, next profile, uh, picture profile number six. And again, this is Cine Gamma 1, so it's actually very similar to 5, but with one key difference is that this one's broadcast safe. So picture profile uh, 5 can go to 109% recording range. And if you're doing something for broadcast direct to air, that will get clipped at 100%. So your nice sky that didn't look overexposed will suddenly look overexposed when it's broadcast. So if it isn't going to be graded, if it's going to go direct to air, use picture profile 6 because it's broadcast safe. It doesn't go above 100%. No problems with this going direct to air. So this would be my go-to one if I was doing live news or anything like that. Again, all the benefits of Cinegamma, which is um, ease of... Um, uh, good, good overexposure tolerance and things like that. It will look a little bit darker than PP5 because the levels are brought down a bit, but that's but it's going to keep you broadcast safe. So you're not going to get any nasty surprises um, when you go uh, into post. And actually, I think there's, a, there's a, an error on this slide. It should actually say Cine Gamma number two. So it's Cine Gamma number two that's broadcast safe. Um, looking at the FS7 um, for a minute, um, hypergamma's very similar to the Cine Gamma's. So you don't have picture profiles in the FS7. It's one of the things, actually, that makes the FS7 in some respects a little bit harder to use. You haven't got all these different scene files. You can just dial up those first six. Um, uh, but, you know, hypergamma you have, which is very similar. So um, some ideas here. So hypergamma number one, broadcast safe, medium dynamic range is quite good for duller scenes. Um, hypergamma number two, again, broadcast safe, high dynamic range is good for brighter scenes. Uh, Hypergamma number three, full range, medium dynamic range, good for duller scenes. So this records to 109%. Hypergamma number four, full range, high dynamic range. Really, this one's really good for bright scenes. If I'm shooting a bright outdoor scene, this is my go-to uh, hypergamma for, for stuff like that. Um, hypergamma number four and number two, they're actually the same gamma curves, just two records below 100% all the time, keeping it broadcast safe. Three allows it to go to 109. Uh, sorry, four allows it to go to 109. Then we have hypergamma seven and eight, and these are quite interesting. They're, they're huge dynamic ranges, um, very high dynamic range. And number seven is really good for high contrast outdoor scenes. And then number eight is very good for really bright outdoor scenes. But both of these are a little bit noisier. They show more noise than the others. Um, I tend to stick to hypergammas three and four um, rather than seven and eight myself, um, but you can use any of any of them. Um, if you want to match cameras, so let's say you've got a shoot FS5 or possibly even an A7S, A7R, and then the FS7 as well, or an F5 because the F5 and FS7 are pretty similar. It's worth stating straight away that they'll never be perfect matches. They have different image processing even though the FS5 and the FS7 share the same sensor, the different image processing does mean that man, no matter what you do, they're going to look different. 
um, but you can do some things to get them very, very close. And the simplest one really actually to make a, an FS5 and FS7 match, if you're not going to do all the grading, is to set the FS5 to uh, picture profile number five, which is Cine Gamma num number one with cinema color, and then the FS7 to use Hyper Gamma number four and the cinema matrix. And to do that, you have to turn the preset matrix function on in the FS7, and you'll get, they'll be pretty close. They won't be identical, but if they're doing two different angles, within the same shot, they'll be close enough that they'll, they'll, they'll look quite good. You might want to do a tiny bit of adjustment in post just to, to fine tune it. Or of course, shoot S-log on both. If you use the same S-log and the same S-gamma on both, again, they'll look very, very close. They won't quite be identical, but they'll be damned close. Mm. It um, might be useful actually just asking the audience whether, mm. if you want to put in any questions or, or anything about matching cameras, if you your experience is that it was easy to match these two cameras or not, um, and then we could actually pass that on to the rest of the audience. I think yeah. it would be quite useful. Yes, certainly. Uh, yeah, right, you, you, know, you can give us comments as questions. will we'll, we'll, yes. uh, be interesting to look at. Um, so um, let's just take a couple of questions, shall we, before we yes, move, move on. on. Um, yeah, if you've got a comment here, actually, from someone saying that you found the high and low key function extremely useful and gave me the confidence to go with the settings I was using. I use it with just about every shoot. So high and low key is an FS7 function that allows you to use a lookup table. And then when you press it, press the high and low key button the first time, um, you see, let me just go to, I've actually got some slides about this somewhere. Um, okay. So yeah, we're just pausing while the man yeah, looks so at the computer. Yeah, so we're just high and low key. So this is um, what you would see with the lookup table. Um, on the camera, this is your, what you'd see in the viewfinder, the regular thing. And you might look at that and think, oh, the sky is a bit bright. Is the sky overexposed when you're looking at the lookup table? But when you assign high and low key to a button, um, the first time you press it, it darkens the LUT. So it makes the LUT yeah. much darker. You see it says high key in the top left corner of the, the viewfinder. And you can see that the sky is not overexposed. It looks overexposed in the LUT because the LUT's only showing you a small part of the range. But then when you look at the high key, you can see, no, that sky is not overexposed. And then when you press the button again, it shows you the low key. So it shows you your low range. And then you can see the shadows. So on the tree on the left, you can see how far into those shadows you can actually see. And then when you press the button again, you go back to the LUTed image. So it yeah. really is a great way of working um, with uh, Cine EI to allow you to see that, that full um, exposure range. So let me just um, go back to where we were in the presentation. So um, yeah, so that's a really useful thing. Um, can we just, what other questions have we got? So let's go to the top with our questions. Um, so I've got a question here, looking at upgrading from a Z5, is the difference to an FS5 too big or should I be looking at a PXW150? Well, the gap between a Z5 and a 150 isn't very big at all. So you're not going to learn anything helpful. So if you go from the, the Z5 to the 150, you're still going to have to make the jump from the 150 to an FS5. There's yes. still a big jump there. So you really, to be honest, you may as well just, if, if the FS5 is the camera that you feel is the one that you need and you want, just take the plunge and go for it. Because at some point, you're going to have to make that step and the step really is to a large sensor camera. Um, yeah, Z150, it's not really a big sensor camera. That, that big step and that thing that's going to give you the headaches is you're going from a camera with a built-in zoom lens, it's all, all in one unit, it does everything internally, to a camera where suddenly you can change lenses, it's a much bigger sensor, the depth of field is shallower, you zoom in and out and your focus shifts and all of those things. So at some point, you're going to have to make that jump. Um, if you've got lots and lots of money in your pocket and you can afford to have both, well, yeah, go for it. But if you, you know, there's no point that I can see of buying a, a one Z150 as an intermediate step. Just take the plunge, bite the bullet, go for the FS5 if that is the right camera for you. Yeah. And and I would say at this point, yeah, do think long and hard before making that jump, because. You know, cameras like the Z150 or even, you know, the Z150 in particular, you know, the built-in zoom lens, it's really versatile. It's, it is easy to use. 
if you're doing fast turnaround run and gun stuff, you're going to find that easy to use. You go up to the FS5, you're going to find it harder to use for run and gun. Um, yes, for potential to produce a much nicer looking picture, but you're going to have to work a lot harder to get that picture. So think long and hard and very carefully, do I really, really want to do it? You know, it, a lot of people get caught up in the fashion thing. It's almost like a fashion event now. It's like, you know, the, the FS5 is kind of the Nike trainers and the Z150, I don't know, would be your, your, your rigger boots or your working boots. You know, do I want running shoes or do I want boots that are going to be you know, comfortable for a long period or going to protect my toes if somebody drops something on it? Make sure you buy the right thing. Yeah. And, and I guess to ease that decision would be to hire it possibly for a weekend. Indeed. Good and, idea. And then you can hire it. You, know, you can look at it. And if that's not for you, fine. But if it is, at least you've done it that way, which is a safer option or less risky option rather than paying all that money and deciding you don't like it afterwards. And, and I think that's really important because I think we, as a society, I don't want to get into any political here, but I think we've become far too focused on buying and doing stuff online. Mm. And I know an awful lot of camera purchasing decisions now are made on based on what people like myself write online. And yeah, absolutely. Use, do your research, read the reviews, look at the blogs and everything else. And don't, don't just look at one, look at lots, get lots of different opinions. But go to a dealer or rent a camera. Get your hands on one, you know, properly. Go to the dealer and, and be a pain and sit in their showroom for a couple of hours and play with the cameras yes, you're thinking yeah. about. Or just rent them. Yeah. You know, don't make the decision purely based on what you read online. Just get them in your hands and try them. Yeah, you know, you're spending a lot of money on these cameras. You know, if you make the right choice, it's going to last you two, three, four years. Make the wrong choice, six months later, you're going to be trying to sell it on or whatever, and you're not going to get your money back. It's a bad, yeah, you've wasted a whole bunch of money, and you know, it's not a good thing to do. So get your hands on them, borrow, beg, borrow, scrounge, rent, hire, whatever. You know, and if you can, I, I would, I learned so much about a camera on the first shoot. You know, and I, it's, maybe it's a little bit risky to rent a camera for a paying job, but sometimes it's the best way to actually figure out, is this the right camera for me? Yes. You know, you know, take your existing camera with you as well as a backup, so you've got a fallback, but rent a camera, use it on a paying job when the pressure is on, because then you're going to find out the, the real ins and outs about that camera. Sure. Excellent. Excellent um, advice. Second generation of domestic HDR TVs will appear next year, offering even better quality. Yes, that is a very valid comment. First generation is here now, although to be honest, second generation has arrived. I was talking earlier in the year to people about this amazing 4,000 nit HDR TV that I saw at IBC behind NAB behind closed doors and how amazing it was. Well, it's actually been released now. Okay. It's a product. Um, it's quite expensive, it's about £4,000, but it's an amazing piece of kit. And that is the second generation HDR. It's here now. It's you know, not long. Again, this is going to be a you get what you pay for thing. If you pay 800, 800 to 1,000 pounds, your HDR is not going to be as good as if you pay 4,000 um, pounds. But at second generation is already arriving. Um, is it um, okay? So, are there any e mount lenses for the FS5 that offer the user manual apertures and zoom control um, as the fully automated 18 to under 5 slide can be a bit restricting? Well, the fully automated about 18 to 105, well, you can use that in full manual. You can turn it to manual, and the focus ring is manual, and the aperture is manual if you're using the dial on the side of the camera. On the E-mount lenses, um, none of them have an iris ring, an aperture ring. It's always done by the camera body. Um, but And focus rings do tend to be servo-driven, although the new um, G Masters are very, very nice lenses really nice lenses that have a, a, a really good focus ring on them. But it's still not that sort of calibrated scale. I mean, the only one you've got, of course, is the 28 to 135 millimeter f4 lens that you can get with the fs7. And that's a fully manual lens with an aperture ring and everything else. So, you know, um, they, that is the only one that exists. And I know Sony are incredibly aware that people overall like that lens, but it's not wide enough. Yep. They're very, very aware of that. And everyone I talk to in Sony and I tell them, you know, yeah, we know, we know, we know. And it's kind of a watch this space situation. Of course, IPC is not very far away. So sure. watch this space. Mm. Um, 
Is the step down to 4208 bit from 4210 bit when shooting in 4K rather than HD something to worry about on the FS5? Okay. Yes and no. It does depend on what you're doing. If you're going to shoot log, it's becomes it's very much relevant because with log you really ideally want 10 bit. Now, it's not that you can't do log with 8-bit, it's just that it's far from ideal. And if you're shooting log with 8-bit, you absolutely must nail your exposure. There's no room for error. You need to be exposed at the Sony recommended levels plus one to one and a half stops. If you're not, you're in a lot of hurt. You're going to struggle to get a good result. Um, so, so if you, but if you're not doing that, if you're just shooting for a corporate video and you're going to use Cinegamma or something like that, 10-bit, uh, sorry, 8-bit UHD is going to give you a good result. Um, it's not broadcast quality though. So broadcasters, they want 10-bit 42 UHD or 4K recording. Um, the way around that, and I actually have a slide here, is to consider the FS5 RAW option because that gets around that limitation. Um, and I would consider this option for many reasons, actually. It's not really that expensive. I think it's about, um, about £800, pounds, six, six to £800, pounds, 600 something, £400. Pounds. I'm, I've got somebody waving 400 and thumbs up. Wow, it's a lot less than I thought it was. Plus VAT will bring it to about about six, five, 600 So it's not a lot of money. So if you've got the version 2 firmware, you can add this update to the camera and then consider an external recorder, either the Odyssey 7, 7Q, uh, one of the Atomos products. You have the Shogun Flames, the Shoguns, the Ninja, not the Ninjas, first it has to be a Shogun, um, that can take that raw stream as an output. Now, even if you don't record raw, what you have to understand is if you've got that raw stream coming out of the camera, it is in addition to the video camera's two internal streams. So the FS5 has a limitation, there's a few limitations really. Um, you have a limitation in so much as in UHD, it's only 8 bits, whether that's to an external output or in internal recording. It's 8 bit, no matter what you do. The other limitation the camera has is it can only generate two streams of video internally. One of those is normally used for the internal recording, and the other stream is used to go to the viewfinder. If you plug in an external monitor and you hit record, then you lose the viewfinder image because there's still only two video streams. One's being recorded, the other is feeding your monitor. You can decide whether it's on the monitor or on the viewfinder in the menu, but you have this limitation. But the raw stream is an additional stream, it's a third stream. So what that means is you can take the raw output from the camera, you can record your UHD internally as normal, and then use the raw stream to your monitor as a monitor feed. So you can now have the viewfinder, record UHD internally, and have an external monitor all at the same time. So even for that, I think it's worth the, the 400 pounds, just to give you the ability to, obviously you've got to pay for an external monitor as well, um, which has to be one of the raw capable uh, recorders. You can't just put your um, TV Logic monitor on there or whatever. So you have to have one of these, but it gets around that limitation. And then, of course, on the external monitor, you don't have to shoot RAW because either the Odyssey or the Shogun will convert from the RAW to ProRes. So you can record externally 10-bit 42 ProRes. That makes your um, external recording broadcast, uh, 4K broadcast legal and everything else. And if you really, really want to, you can shoot the 12-bit RAW as well, which is a little bit higher quality. Not massively so, but it is a bit, you know, it is a bit better. Um, has to be exposed well, can't underexpose it. Um, so it gives you a lot more flexibility for really not a lot of money. It really does significantly enhance the FS5. So I really, really would consider it um, as an option. Okay. Um, coming back to the questions, I find it hard matching A7S2 and FS5. I shoot both an S or two. You will do. They are totally different sensors, um, completely different processing. The, the cameras couldn't be, I, I know they're both from Sony and I, I know they're both S-Log and everything else, but they couldn't be more different. The sensor is so different and of course we all know that if you put different lenses on a camera, the picture will look different. Well, if you put a different sensor in the camera, it's going to look different. And no matter how you try and match it and everything else, unfortunately the reality is they're never going to look exactly the same. Um, what hypergamma would you use on an FS7 in a studio situation? 
Um, I would use um, I would use hypergamma number three. Um, let me just go back up to the hypergamma slides. I would use hypergamma number three, slightly lower dynamic range. Um, I've got on here for duller scenes, but of course in a studio application, you are controlling the light. So you're not going to light it. You can light at a slightly lower dynamic range. Um, the lower dynamic range of the hypergamma means that you'll have more contrast in the finished picture, um, but you're still going to get that nicer highlight roll off. So your highlights are going to look much better and things like that. The picture will be nice and contrasty. And that would be my choice. If it's live, then it would be hypergamma one because that's broadcast safe. So hypergamma number three would be my, my choice for a studio scene. But of course, just to say, you know, with, with all of these things, you know, this is a creative business. So just because I like hypergamma number three doesn't mean to say you have to use hypergamma number three. That would be my choice. I'll give you the reasons why, but experiment, play, figure out what works for you. Um, something else, we'll come back to questions in a minute, and we've got lots, which is great. Calibrate your viewfinder, um, or at mm -hmm. least check it. So the cameras have built into them SMPT arbitrary HD bars, and when you bring them on, you see the lovely color bars in the viewfinder. The key thing is the white square at the bottom is 100% white. That is as bright as the viewfinder can go. It can't go any brighter than that. Um, and of course, we're talking about standard dynamic range here. We're not talking about HDR or anything with the viewfinder. So you actually um, increase the um, brightness, sorry, the, increase the contrast, get this right, increase the contrast until the white stops getting any brighter. Then you back your contrast down until you find that point where the white is as bright as it gets, but no more. And then you adjust the brightness so that you cannot see the minus two bar. You shouldn't be able to see it. It's blacker than black. If you can see it, your brightness is too high. But you should just, and it really, really is going to be just, be able to see the um, uh, plus two uh, setting. Um, I have a problem here. And you should definitely be able to see the uh, plus four. Um, we've got a minor technical hitch. Perhaps we could go back to the questions on this for a moment. Yes, certainly, absolutely. Okay, so do I ever shoot a grayscale chart when attempting matching cameras or another chart? Absolutely, yes. It's one of the best ways to ensure or to, to get your camera matching. And I was with a top end colorist the other day and he was moaning about you know <laughs> oh, people never shoot charts anymore they are so useful um, because you know especially use a known reference so the, the two go-to charts I would use my the one I normally use is called a DSC one shot from uh, DSC labs a very simple chart it's not got a lot on it. it's got um, actually I've got a picture of a DSC one shot in my presentation um, somewhere okay. uh, here because actually, I had in, uh, prepared pre prepared Oh, no, wrong slide. Just bear with me. Um, okay. Here we go. Right. Because I was actually going to suggest that people do, in, do invest in a chart or a grayscale. Um, I'm not sure if you're seeing the slide or not at the moment. Um, no, you're not seeing the correct slide. Okay, we have a problem with um, one of the computers here at the moment, so you're not seeing something. So the DSC one shot chart, why would I invest in that particular chart? And if you can't see the picture, Google it, DSC labs one shot. Um, on the front of the chart, um, looks like you're seeing the slide now. On the front of the chart, you have a, a, sort of a, a small grayscale and color tones. A, color, a colorist um, grading suite can match these charts really, really easily. So if you've shot it with two different cameras, especially using Resolve, it actually recognize this chart and do an automatic match, which is a really very quick way to match two cameras. Um, so that's the chart that would be my go-to chart. Um, it's made of plastic. It's really tough. It's going to last you a long, long time, many, many years. The other chart that you can use for color matching, of course, is the Macbeth chart or a color checker, which has lots and lots of different colors on it. The only problem with that is because it's a printed on paper, black isn't black. The DSC chart is a glossy chart, so the black actually looks black. Whereas on the, the one shots, the blacks are slightly gray. Um, so the, the color checker can be used. And again, Resolve, DaVinci Resolve recognizes it, very good for matching multiple cameras. 
Um, but they're made of cardboard. They don't last as long. They're still expensive. They're still in the 80, 90 pound region. It's only going to last you six months to a year because it's going to degrade very quickly, especially if it gets wet or anything like that. So you'll end up replacing them over three or four years. You'll spend more on those than you would on one of the one shots because the one shot, yes, it's more expensive. It's a one time investment. The other thing about the one shot chart is on the rear, you have middle gray and white. And the reason I put this slide in here actually was to actually talk a little bit about white balance, because a lot of people tend to white balance with white. They think white balance, white card. Yeah. And it's actually not the best way to do it. You really should use a gray card, a proper middle gray gray card. And the reason for that is because the gray is darker. If the, there's any color, so, so typically one of the biggest problems we have is shooting with fluorescent or LED lights with a little bit of green. That won't show up on a white card. It's too bright. You will not see that green tint. The white card is, is just not going to show it, whereas the gray card will. So the camera will balance it out or it'll help minimize it if you use a gray card to do your white balance. So you really want to invest in a gray card to do your white balance. For a gray card, I really like the one on the right here, which is the last light pop-up one, because the, the little case is tiny. You know, hang it off your belt, doesn't take up any space, and the little case keeps it clean. And you have gray on the front, white on the back. So you can also use it for setting exposure if you're using log, but you do your white balance with a gray card, not a white card, and you'll get much better, much more accurate white balance when you're doing that. And the other thing I would, you know, while we're talking about buying stuff or getting hold of stuff, Something else I would consider um, is uh, a color filter swatch. You can pick them up at trade shows, or if you contact most of the filter companies, they'll, they'll give you these. And it's a little book of color filters. And the Lee, for example, do a cinematographer size, which is a fairly sort of squarish one. And you can use these for all sorts of things, because you can place it across the lens to, to put in offsets. So this book will have your minus G filters in it and all of those things in there. And rather than putting the minus green gel on the light and to, to correct the light, the other way you can do it is leave the lights ungelled and then um, you can do your white balance through the filter. So you put the filter in front of the camera and do the white balance through the filter. So you'd actually want a plus G to put green into the camera, which then effectively ends up giving you minus G when you shoot. Um, so they're really worth having. The other thing you can do is you can use them to offset your white balance. So if you're doing your white balance, use a minus blue to warm the picture up across the lens or a, um, a, a warming filter across the lens to cool the picture when you shoot. And you can get these for free if you go to a trade show or contact Lee, I think. Don't everyone go at once. Um, but yeah, you can pick them up. You often get them for free and they're really useful because when you're white balancing, you don't have to fill the entire frame with your white card. It just needs to be the center, sort of 30, 40% of the frame that needs to be covered. So your gel doesn't have to cover the whole of the lens. It's only got to cover that middle bit. So these are, are, are quite good to, um, to use. Yeah, that's so, great. So um, <laughs> coming back to more questions, we, we do have lots of questions. In terms of lenses, do you use non-Sony lenses with the FS5, FS7 with adapters? Yes, I do, absolutely. I have the Metabones adapters and the Comlight adapters, and I use Canon lenses um, or Canon mount lenses a lot. I don't need to change any of my camera settings when I'm doing that. You just put the lens on and just go. Um, the only thing is, of course, you have the click stop. The, the apertures go in steps on the Canon electronic lenses. If you have an FS5, not a problem because you can use the variable ND filter instead to control your aperture. That is the most wonderful tool ever in a video camera, the variable ND filter. Um, but in terms of um, color balance and picture profiles and everything else that, like that, no, it makes no difference what brand of lenses that you're using. Um, uh, Rematching FS5 to FS7, is there any noticeable difference between um, XABCL to XABCI? Not really, not in terms of picture matching. I would always try and use XABC-I in the FS7 when I can. It's a much easier codec to work with in post-production than, than, than XABC-L. But of course, if the FS5, you've got to use XABC-L. Um, Samyang Sinu lens have a physical uh, aperture rim. Yes, good point. Actually, if you do get the E-mount Samyang lenses, they have um, mechanical aperture ring, but they're not Sony lenses, but they, they do a um, Sony mount lens. 
Um, so you can use those, and that is a very good point. Thank you very much for that. Um, I use the Samyangs on a Canon mount. I bought the Canon mount ones because then I can use them on multiple cameras. I can use them on a Canon camera. I can use them on a Sony camera with that mechanical aperture ring. I'm really pleased with them. Not the best lens in the world, but they are really good value for money. Um, yeah, you, you get a great value for the money. Um, okay, so um, someone's commented that the guy that was going from the Z5 might be better off with a PMW 200 or 300. Quite possibly. Um, you know, and this is why it's important. You really have to look, and it's a project that I'm working on for Sony right now, is, is um, some documentation to help people make the right choice of camera. Don't get swayed by fashion. Think about what it is that you need. Yeah. Um, PMW 200, PMW 300, great cameras for, for run and gun, for ENG and stuff like that. So lots of cameras to consider when you're looking at buying a camera. Sure, and, and again, um, you know, most dealers who have a higher um, arm to them will be able to do that. They'll be able to give you, um, you know, three or four cameras, and then you can then make the choice rather than, and it, it's a waste of time trying to do that at the trade show because you're yeah. just never going to get it. It's too busy. Like, yeah, it's yeah. too busy. You're better off going to your dealer of choice and, and asking them, and, and, a, and a proper dealer will be, have those available mm. and allow you to do that. Um, so um, would I, would closing the iris do the same rewrite balancing? No, it won't because the white card, so it's obviously, you know, closing, you know, you could use a white piece of paper and then close the white, close the aperture to make it darker. No, it won't because that white piece of paper, it's still reflecting 90% of the light falling on it, whereas the gray card only reflects um, 18%. And that's the difference. It's the amount of reflected light that impacts the way the white balance works. It's not the exposure. It is the light coming off the card that you are shooting. So it's not the same thing. Um, does the 28-235 supplied with the FS7 work on the FS5? Yes, absolutely it does. Um, kind of makes it quite front heavy and quite a larger camera, but absolutely, of course you can use it with the FS5, no problem at all. And what are my thoughts of that lens on the FS7? It's a good lens, it's a very usable lens. The zoom is a little bit slow, we know that, um, but it's par focal, so you can zoom in and out during the shot. And you, I think you still have to consider how cheap that lens is for what it is. The, the new Canon 18 to 80 lens is four times the price of that 28 to 135. Yes, the Canon zooms faster, um, but it's no bigger zoom range. Um, doesn't really have a lot of other benefits, really. It's a little bit more compact, perhaps. But the, the 28 to 135 is a good lens. It's just not wide enough. You can get wide angle adapters that will go on the front. I think Century Optics have got one for it now to make it wider, but it gets heavier and bigger and clunkier when you do that. Um, but as I say, Sony are well aware that yeah, there's a demand for a wider sure. lens. I mean, if you want just to step in there, if you want to see the Canon 18 to 80, we have it on uh, Tuesday next week. We'll be running an open day, which is free to attend. And you'll be able to see not only that lens, but some other Canon products. So if, if that's what you're considering, and please pop along, register on our website. Yes, and we are sort of running out of time. Um, and really great to see so many questions. Let's try and get through. Um, yeah. uh, what I consider the Samyang and Speed Booster for field of view with extra stop of light. Absolutely great combination. Samyang lens um, with the Speed Booster gives you that extra stop of light, slightly wider, improves the MTF, everything else. It's a really good combination. Yes, I would absolutely consider that. Um, and, and again, there's something that I do myself. When I go to Norway and do the Northern Lights, it's a Samyang lens with a speed boost. It's one of my prime lenses for doing it, I think. It's the 24 um, uh, T1.4, 1.5. Uh, with a speed boost, it gives me equivalent to a T.9. You know, fantastic for shooting in low light. Um, what are the possibilities of the FS5 while record? What are the possibilities of the FS5 while recording slow motion in an external recorder? I read you, you can record 240 frames per second in UHD. Um, no, you can't because when you're shooting at 240 frames per second, the camera is actually uh, basically operating in HD. The sensor is being read in HD. Um, the output is HD. You can record that output, so you have to do it. You have to reset the camera to 60 frames per second, so you have to be in NTSC area, 60 frames per second, and then you record your external recorder at 60 frames per second. So the 240 comes off the sensor in HD, is processed down to 60 when you when it's buffering. So when you hit the record button and it's being copied to the camera's menu mem memory, 
you get a 60 frame per second stream that contains the 240 frame per second frames. And you can record that onto an external recorder at ProRes if you want that better quality. And then you take that 60 frame per second clip, you slow it down or play it back at 25 or 24 or whatever frame that you want. And then you get the 240 frame per second slow motion. You can do it. A lot of faffing around, a lot of work to do it because the XABC recordings internally, they're pretty damn good quality anyway. So it's not a great deal to be, back, to be gained from doing that. A lot of work, very little gain. Uh, would I recommend the FS5 for long lens or wildlife filming? It's a good choice. You can do some slow motion. It's a good budget option for wildlife filming. Of course, you can put some nice long Canon or even Sony lenses on there, but there's some great sort of 600 mil Canons and things like that. And I know people that do use it for wildlife. If you're doing wildlife for broadcast, really you want the FS7 because you want that XABC-L codec, you want the 4K or UHD um, and things like that. The clear image zoom, however, on the FS5, of course, you can use that with your long lens. One of the big problems with using a long telephoto lens is framing. You know, you've got, um, if you put a, something like 150 to 600 or 150 to 300 mil lens on there, first of all, you have to find the damn thing. It's a bird flying through the air. You have to find it in the viewfinder first. And then, you know, get the lens zoomed in and focused. It's all a bit tricky. Clear image zoom allows you to, to have the lens, say, at 150 millimeters, set the camera up to clear image zoom and in HD, then you can find the bird and zoom in with the clear image zoom, the electronic zoom, there's virtually no loss of quality, and that allows you to frame and work that way a bit better when you're shooting in HD. Nice little function. Um, will the 12 millimeter Samyang Sony work with the auto ND filter? Yes, well any, any lens that goes on the FS5 you can use with the auto ND filter. The auto ND filter is a camera function. So provided the lens physically attaches to the camera and gives you a picture without the ND filter, it will work with the auto ND. And I say auto ND is just so good because it means you can use manual lenses or electronic lenses that have stepping irises like the Canons and get smooth aperture changes. Really great things. Um, am I shooting with the graphical or using the standard viewfinder? I use both depending on the situation. I have the standard graphical. It's bigger than the standard viewfinder. So if I need to be portable and lightweight, I use the standard finder. If I'm doing slow motion, I'll use the graphical because I can put all my LUTs when I'm shooting slow motion in log in the viewfinder in the graphical. So I don't have that gets around the camera's internal limitations. The viewfinder is using an FS5 and you want to shoot log a lot. I recommend getting a graphical, either the eye or the full size one, because you can have all the lookup tables and you can put all your exposure offsets and everything else you need in the viewfinder. And it gets around the fact that the FS5 doesn't have any lookup tables. So a nice investment um, with, with the graphical. Any back focus issues, issues using, you don't mind if we overrun a bit, do you? No, no, we're, no, we're going to keep going. If, we're, if we'll keep going happen. for a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, does the um, uh, back focus with speed boosters and adapters? Sometimes, yes, they are adjustable though. The speed boosters have an adjustment screw to adjust the back focus, um, as do the, the, um, the regular adapters as well. They can be made slightly thicker or thinner. So you do need to check that they are correctly set because some people do get them and they find that the back focus is out, but the adapters are, certainly the Metabones ones are adaptable. Generally with the, the normal ones, it's not a problem. It's with the speed boosters, but there's a little adjusting screw that allows you to adjust the back focus to get it set correct. Um, does the 28 to 135 mm FS7 lens fit the FS5? Absolutely, yes it does. Um, would you consider Samyang uh, and Speed Booster? We've covered that one. Yep. Um, does the FS5 need a rig if using it handheld? Ooh, depends. That's, that's a how long is a piece of string question, if ever I've had one. The only problem with adding a rig to the FS5 is anything you add to it makes it heavier. And I, one of the things I love about the FS5, and you know, I, I, like, I really enjoy shooting with my FS5, is it is so lightweight. And you know, this is the whole thing, if you add a graphical viewfinder to an FS5, yeah, great, it gets around the LUT problem, but then you're talking about something that weighs and costs as much as an FS7 would have done, so maybe you should have bought the FS7. Um, as soon as you start adding stuff to it, it gets much heavier quickly. Because it's so light, just putting a shoulder mount on it can double the weight. The camera's only 800 grams. You put a 500, 600 gram shoulder bracket on there, which isn't much, that's a very lightweight one, and you've practically doubled the weight of the camera. And then it becomes more fatiguing to hold it. It doesn't 
really work on the shoulder either because the problem is that all the buttons are back on the body of the camera. To be able to see the viewfinder, you've got to have it mounted quite for, far forwards and then it all becomes front heavy and you end up having to support more weight with your arms than you would do if you took all the rubbish off and just held the camera in your hand. So, I don't know, it, I, I'm not going to say no, you can't do it or shouldn't do it because some people will want to do it and they'll have different reasons to me for, for needing to do that. So if you need to put the camera on your shoulder or you need to do stuff with it, then yes, you might have to build it up. But personally, I, the, the, the real strength of the FS5 is its weight and its size. Keep it light, keep it simple. Don't start bolting a whole load of other stuff onto it because it just gets heavy and then you get, it gets fatiguing. Keep, you know, that's the beauty of the FS5 is it is light and small. You want to keep that um, so, I think that's about it. Uh, yeah, and I think that's just about it with the oh. questions. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Here we, oh, oh, come, no, no, come no. on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Loads more questions have suddenly flown in. What's the best viewfinder for these cameras? Um, frankly, right now, the Zacutos, either the Gratical, the large one, or the Gratical Eye. If you need to feed a client monitor and you need to put lookup tables on a client monitor, the, gra the full-size Gratical, will do that for you. The Gratical Eye it doesn't have the output, but if you want small and light, the Gratical Eye is fabulous. Tiny little viewfinder adds nothing in terms of size and weight to the cameras. Um, I have the full size one. I keep thinking, oh, I'm gonna trade it in and get the small one, but then I keep thinking, well, actually, no, some of the, the output options and loop through options are really useful, so I'll probably stick with the larger one. Maybe, maybe if I'm feeling flush one day, I might buy the smaller one, the Eye as well. Um, great viewfinders, they really are. Great, great little viewfinders. I, I can't recommend them enough. And the last question we're going to do, this has been, oh, it's a comment really great, um, uh, helpful. Uh, so some, uh, thanks to me and Rob, so thank you very much uh, for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the session, over to you, Rob, really, you can wrap things up for us, I guess. Yes, another fantastic session from Alistair. Thanks very much for coming and for um, imparting a lot of your knowledge and wisdom. I'm sure people got a I lot of I didn't get through half the slides. There's loads of slides I was ready to show. Well, that's great, because um, we can do part two. So if anyone's interested in part two, then please let us know. Absolutely. Um, as always, uh, as I say, thank you to Alistair and the technical team here. Um, thank you for listening and joining in. It's made it a lot more... Um, enjoyable for I think for everyone by having. I, I really think it makes all the difference having the questions because then I mean it's, it's what you guys want to know. I and mean, I can prepare a hundred slides and it can actually be irrelevant to you lot. But you know, so when we get the questions, I think it's a much it's much much better. Yeah, we'll all you know we'll always tailor it to you know to what they want, and we'll be doing lots more during the summer. So thanks very much. Um, enjoy your holidays. I'm off on holiday next week. Oh, Everyone you. I'm sure is interested. Um, so bye for now. And if you want to look at any events, please check out the visuals.co.uk website. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys.